Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm uh, Vu Tran. I teach fiction in the program in creative writing. And uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I'm really, really pleased to, to welcome Garth Greenwell here to the, the university, uh, to the program in creative writing. Uh, he's the first uh, visiting writer in our Fictions and Forms uh, reading series this year, which invites to campus some of the most, I think, at least uh, exciting and, and most important contemporary fiction writers in the country. In previous years, uh, we've had Vit Tang Nguyen, Akhil Sharma, and Molly Antipal. Uh, later this year, uh, we'll be having Samantha Hunt and Alexander Chi in the winter and spring quarters, respectively. So uh, now to, to Garth himself. I first became familiar with uh, Garth Greenwell's writing uh, from reading his trenchant essays uh, in places like The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and The Guardian uh, about fiction and poetry and the writing process, about art and artists primarily, uh, and very often about sex and sexuality. These essays do what all great writing does. They simultaneously move you <coughs> and challenge you to see the world in a new, more difficult, but meaningful light. In his Guardian piece on James Baldwin's great novel, Giovanni's Room, Garth remembers reading writers like Baldwin, Edmund White, and Jeanette Winterson during his youth in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, and how it's now, quote, hard to overstate what those books meant growing up in the American South, or the solace I took from them and from their vision of queer life as possessed of a measure of human dignity. It didn't matter that that dignity was so often the dignity of tragedy, it was still a kind of antidote to shame, unquote. The sensitivity to the tragic proportions of shame and the value and elusiveness of dignity animates Garth's first novel, What Belongs to You, about a young American teacher in Bulgaria and his passionate and problematic relationship with a young hustler he first meets in a public bathroom in the novel's opening chapter. This relationship forces him to confront the shame he still carries from his childhood in the American South, where his nascent sexuality was met with brutal rejection. In a meditative voice reminiscent of Virginia Woolf and W.G. Siebold, though laced with a lyricism and graphic honesty that is very much Garth's own style, the novel challenges us to see through society's common notions of illicit queer sexual behavior, and thus reveals to us the complex humanity behind it, which is both specific to this experience and universal. It reveals to us the messy entrails of desire, and its vitalizing potential too, and how this all inevitably shapes our ideas of agency, selfhood, and love. What Belongs to You, uh, right here, won the British Book Award for debut of the year, was long listed for the National Book Award, and was a finalist for six other honors, <coughs> including the Penn Faulkner Award, the James Tate Black Memorial Prize, and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. It's the New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice, uh, and, and was also named the best book of 2016 by uh, over 50 publications in nine countries and is being translated into a dozen languages. Uh, Garth Greenwell currently lives in Iowa City and he was good enough to come be with us here at the University of Chicago for the next two days. And uh, I'm really, really thrilled uh, to finally meet him. Uh, so please help me welcome him. Hi, thank you so much, Vu, for that introduction and for inviting me to be here with you. Thank you so much for, for coming out tonight. So uh, the novel came out about two years ago now. And I remember when I was a student and writers would come and they would say things like, oh, I'm so bored of this novel. And I would think, no, you're not. Like, you're, but no, they really were. <laughs> and so I'm not going to read from the novel. I'm going to read from the book that I'm finishing now but it's very much a companion to the novel. Um, it's a collection of stories. All of the stories are narrated by the narrator of what belongs to you. Maybe something I'll talk about tomorrow is the fact that it was very early on evident to me that what belongs to you was a kind of streamlined container, that it was very focused on this particular relationship, and that there were lots of things in the world that didn't fit into that container. And the stories are kind of more mobile um, and diverse. In the third part of the novel, um, as Vu said, the novel is about a relationship between this American expat narrator and a young, younger Bulgarian man named Mikko. But in the third section of the novel, which takes place a couple of years after the first, uh, the narrator has a more traditional relationship. Um, 
with a man named R, his boyfriend. And R is an important character in the novel, but hardly appears. And he's a central character in several of the stories. So I'm going to read the title story, or I'm going to read the beginning and the end. I'm going to skip the middle of the title story of the book um, I'm trying to finish. It's called Cleanness. I'm not used to reading this, so I've actually never read these first pages before. Um, so I'll be editing as I read. Uh, <laughs> um, it was our usual table next to the window that made up the bulk of the restaurant's east-facing wall. We liked to look out on the garden, where even in mid-October, were it a normal evening, there would have been diners talking and smoking at the tables that were empty now, stripped of their umbrellas and chairs, a chain of black metal locked around their legs. It was a lovely garden, its shrubs and flowers rare and modest. It offered an illusion of seclusion or retreat, a green relief among the concrete desolation of so much of the neighborhood. The illusion was incomplete, of course. There was nothing to be done about the sound of traffic that was so near or the exhaust that tainted the air of the whole district. And of course, one only had to look up to see the gray of the apartment blocks, which put an end to all greenness. It was a garden better enjoyed inside than out, we had learned, a place to rest our eyes. But it was a mistake to sit at our table tonight when there was no restfulness outside, when everything was movement and agitation, as it had been all through the past week since a great wind had swept into or descended upon or laid siege to the city, it's hard to know how to put it or the sense of it shifted with the days. It came up from Africa, the guards at my school said, old men who greeted it with resignation. It carries sand from Africa, you'll feel it, it is a horrible wind. And they were right, I found. There was something almost malevolent about it, as if it were an intelligence or at least an intention, carrying off whatever wasn't secure, worrying every loose edge. It made the city's cheap construction seem cheaper, more provisional and tenuous, a temporary arrangement, as is true of all places I know, though it's a truth I'd rather not acknowledge. Of course I came to hate the wind. R was late, as always, and after half an hour, I had begun to wonder whether he would come at all. He often broke our plans, usually after I made whatever arrangements were required by my own obligations, inconvenient arrangements often enough. It was a popular restaurant, busy with the dinner rush, and I could feel myself becoming a spectacle, quiet in a convivial room, a bit of negative space. I had already fended off several approaches from the server, saying I was waiting for a friend, he was on his way, gesturing to my lifeless phone as though I had had some news of him, though in fact he hadn't responded to the texts I sent. The waiters had become more insistent as the tables around me filled. Soon I would have to order something or leave. Even inside we could hear the wind. It was a sound above our human voices, a sound beyond the scale of living things. I always forgave R when he missed our meetings. I accepted any excuse he offered, whatever my annoyance, I never complained. I wanted to think of this as patience, as understanding of R's many complications, though really I knew it was fear. <coughs> I would push him away if I demanded too much. It had been too long now, I was stealing myself to go, when with a sudden increase of noise and a change of pressure, a slight disorder in the air, the door opened and R came in. He was wearing a hat and scarf and a heavy winter coat, though it wasn't very cold, not, certainly not cold enough for such an elaborate defense. But then he was from a warm country. It was his first time facing a real fall. He grew up in the Azores, and though all the photos I had found online of his town were gorgeous, orderly, white houses, brilliant against the sea, he would never go back there, he said. It was a small place. He hated small places. He saw me right away, looking immediately toward our table, and without waiting to be greeted by a server, he began making his way to me, pulling off his hat and scarf as he came. I was struck again by the beauty of him, a peculiar, accidental beauty of disheveled hair and rumpled clothes entirely regardless of itself. Even now that it was familiar to me, I felt it 
as a kind of physical force not welcoming me, but pushing me off so that I was always astonished to find I could take him in my arms. This was what I did now, embracing him, though I had intended to, re to remain seated, to greet him coolly and punish him a little. We parted after just a moment, but not before I heard very softly R make a sound I had come to love, <laughs> a little grunt of happiness, a homecoming sound, and all my irritation drained away. It's terrible outside, he said as he sat down, gesturing to the window beside us, the view that was fading as the evening faded. It's totally crazy. I've never seen anything like it. Have you? But it wasn't really a question. He went on before I could answer. He was sorry for being late, he said. He was supposed to go to a party, but had bowed out at the last minute, and then it had been hard to persuade his roommate to go on without him. I thought I wouldn't be able to come, R said, and I made a noncommittal sound, feeling a little of my annoyance return. Oh, he said, hearing it, are you mad? And he wore an expression of such openness and willingness to be ashamed, it was impossible to stay angry. So I told him it was all right, he shouldn't worry, it was nothing. No, he said, it isn't nothing. I hate that I can't see you when I want to. And he made a small gesture on the table, a slight reaching of his hand to mine. We couldn't hold hands, of course, it was a conservative country, it would be imprudent. But he flexed his fingers in a way that I knew meant desire, that though he was touching the polished wood, it was me he wanted to touch. This was clear in his expression, too, when I looked at his face and he said very softly, almost mouthing it, Skupi, one of the few words of Bulgarian he had learned. It means dear or of great price which was what I felt on our second or third meaning, meeting when he lay naked beside me and I ran my hand along his side, tracing the edge of him, and I spoke the word almost without thinking, scuppy, and he asked me what it meant and then drew me to him and whispered it like an affirmation in my ear. It had become our private name for each other, and I think it was then, when we first spoke it, that I realized I was caught by him, that however things turned out, they would have consequence, and I was both frightened by this and gave myself over to it, I decided I would let whatever might happen between us happen. I remembered this when he spoke the word, and then, as if dispelling the atmosphere he had created, he turned his attention to the menu, which the server had long before laid down at his seat. The restaurant had an Italian name, but that didn't mean anything. Nearly every restaurant in Sofia served pizza, and nearly all of them had the same dozen or so Bulgarian dishes, meat and vegetables and eggs. It was the world's least distinctive cuisine, I sometimes thought. Reading over this, I thought, why would you write that? That's such a terrible thing to write, and it's not true. Why would you? I don't know why. Is, are, there any Bulgarians, are there any Bulgarians in the room? That makes me feel worse. There's no one to defend it. Okay. Um, anyway, Bulgarian food is great. You should go eat it. Um, so R studied every page, and then he ordered what he always did, pointing to it mutely with a smile as he angled the menu toward the waitress, a salad of greens and strips of eggplant covered in a sweet dressing that he loved. We handed over our menus, and then R turned his face to the glass beside us, watching the wind, which was visible both in the detritus it carried, papers and leaves, and the little plastic cups coffee comes in here, and in the resistance of everything fixed. Already the last of the light was draining, so that as much as the wind, it was R's face I saw, which was pensive, as he said again, it was a terrible wind. But he was bright-faced when he turned back to me, and I shifted my gaze from his reflection to the real image. He asked me about my day, and I told him something funny, I don't remember what, something at my own expense. He liked stories in which I was a little ridiculous, in which students had the best of me. It had the effect I wanted, which was his laugh, or less his laugh than the transformation his face underwent when he smiled. It isn't true what I said earlier, Really, I think I was caught from our first meeting, or even before our meeting, from the first photographs he sent me that showed his face. We had been chatting for several days by then, emailing back and forth on the dating site where we met, though it wasn't for dating so much as for sex, which at first was all we thought we wanted. And anyway, he was 21, too young to take seriously. 
It might be a bit of fun, I thought when I looked at his profile, a bit of fun, but nothing more. His pictures didn't show very much, mostly his torso, which was thick and unsculpted, a little heavy in a way I liked. In his second email, he sent a link to a video that showed what most men must have wanted to see. He was naked, exposing himself, turning to give a full view before he brought himself off. There was something dispiriting about it, the faceless body too starkly displayed, turning as if on a dice. It shamed me a little to enjoy it. He waited several days before he showed me more, and only after I had promised to be discreet. He wasn't out, he told me, not even to his closest friends, and so it was a pledge of trust and a profounder exposure to send the photo in which finally I saw his face. He was at a club. There were other people behind him in the dark, but he was the only one looking at the camera. The glare of the flash was bright on his skin, and he seemed gripped by joy. There's no other way to say it. His eyes were shut and his mouth stretched impossibly wide, revealing teeth that were large and imperfect, an upper one in front just slightly skewed. When I saw it, I knew I wanted to be smiled at like that. I would never get tired of it, I thought in the restaurant. Each time he smiled, it filled me with a happiness I had never felt before, a happiness that was particularly his. He told me about his day then, which was freer and more varied than mine, the day of a student. He was in Sofia as part of a program that shuttled college students around the EU in an attempt to stitch up the union, though in ours case it hadn't worked. He hated Bulgaria, he said, almost as much as he hated his own country. He had come with Im, a friend from his university in Lisbon. He had thought it would be good to know someone here, but it wasn't good. He felt watched and constrained, bound to the self he would have liked to leave behind, to compromises and deceptions that were really what he hated, I thought, not the country he lived in, but the life he had made there. He was studying physical therapy, Though he had wanted to major in languages, he told me at our first meeting when we, when we spent hours talking in a cafe before he came home with me. His parents insisted that he study something practical, a trade, but nothing's practical now, he said, laughing bitterly a little. There aren't any jobs for anybody in Portugal. I should have just studied what I wanted. He had a talent for languages. His English was almost perfect, natural, and easy, and he said with something like pride when he learned I was a teacher that he had always done well in his literature classes in high school, which were the only classes he enjoyed. When we got to my apartment that first day, before we moved into the bedroom, while we were still in that moment of delay that can be such a pleasure in itself, he spoke a poem to me in his own language, a few lines of Pessoa he said everyone learned in school. It could have been anything, I didn't understand a word of it, but it charmed me and formed the occasion for me to reach to him, to pull him close and press my mouth to his. In Bulgaria, he was studying at the National Sports Academy, though that wasn't the kind of therapy he wanted to do. He wanted to help people, he said, real people with real problems, not athletes with sore muscles. But today, at least, there had been a change of routine, he told me as we waited for our food. Instead of practicing the techniques on each other, members of one of the teams had come in. They stripped to their briefs and laid themselves out on the tables. My guy was so beautiful, R said. He wasn't too big like some of the others, and I got to spend half an hour just touching him. I had to be careful, he went on, lowering his voice enough that I had to lean forward to hear him. I didn't want anyone to see how much I liked him. I was so scared I would touch him wrong. I'm sure it was an awful massage. And he didn't speak any English, so he couldn't tell me how anything felt. I just kept, I kept asking him, okay, okay, until the teacher told me to stop. It was kind of hot, he said, looking up at me, and something he saw made him smile. Are you jealous, he asked, and I denied it too quickly, though it wasn't exactly jealousy, I felt. It made me fear we were in different stories. I would tell that to a friend, not a lover. And it was as though R had heard this thought when he continued. I've never had anybody to talk to about this, he said. You're the only one. And then he smiled again. But I like that you're jealous, he said. It's nice. Nobody's ever been jealous of me before. And again, he made that little gesture with his fingers that was like a caress or the idea of a caress. 
But he snatched his hand back quickly, almost guiltily, as the waitress set down our food, saying first, Zapovyadeti, here you are, and then, more extravagantly, Davie Swadko, may it be sweet to you, a kind of courtesy that was out of place in such a casual restaurant. I glanced up as I thanked her, and in the moment before she turned away, I thought I caught a look on her face that was something more than politeness, a look that was kind, and I wondered whether she had seen our gesture and read it rightly and given it in this small way a kind of blessing. Um, so uh, they get in a fight, <laughs> and the fight is about... Um, the fact that R is always late and breaks dates, and really it's about the fact that um, they can't be open, that R can't be open. And the narrator is impatient with this. He says, look, you live in Portugal, like your friends are these modern European kids. Why won't you just come out? And R responds by telling the narrator a story of his childhood. And it's a very common story. Um, it's a story of abuse and of an abuse that sort of made it difficult for him to lay any kind of affirmative claim to gayness. And in the wake of that story, which I'm skipping, um, they leave. And then I'm going to read you the last few pages. So they step out of the restaurant. Immediately, we were in it. The rush and moil of wind that dragged at us and snatched our breath I couldn't have called out to him now. I had to duck my chin into my coat to breathe. We leaned into the wind as we made our way to the boulevard, slitting our eyes against the grit it carried, whether African sand or, as I imagined, the grime of the streets. We were walking against the wind, kicking against the trash it swept toward us. It's a filthy city, though every morning an army of red-vested women descends upon the streets with brooms and metal pails, cleaners hired to scour the streets endlessly and to no avail. We walked side by side, but it was R who chose the way. He strode as if taking no account of me while I watched for every sign of his intention. At the Zaharov intersection, I thought he might turn toward the metro, putting an end to our evening and maybe to more than our evening. It was easy to imagine him slipping away from me into that life where I had no place. Of course, I had no claim on him. Our entire relationship was founded on claimlessness, founded or not founded, the opposite of founded, I guess. And I was frightened to realize how much I would care if he turned. I would be devastated. How had I let myself feel so much? But he didn't turn. He passed Zaharov and began to cross the parking lot of the supermarket that made one border of the tangle of streets in which I lived, Mladost Edno A, Mladost 1A, the name a remnant of the communist order indecipherable now in the mess of new buildings. The market was nearly empty. It was late, almost closing time, but the automatic glass doors were sliding open and shut, open and shut, though no one was coming in or out. It was something to do with the wind, I thought, the disorder it made of everything. I was glad he was coming home with me, but it meant I would have to have something to say to him when we were out of the wind and together again in my room in the bed where we had said so much to each other. It wasn't true that I had no claim. I thought each word was a claim, his words and mine, and now all I had wanted to say seemed false, or if not false, then irrelevant. Of course, it wasn't his fault, I would say. Of course, he was blameless, entirely blameless. There wasn't any invitation he could have given, even if he had wanted it, that wanting was invalid, though that wasn't what I meant. Not invalid, but a wanting that gave no permission. There wasn't any permission he could give. But none of this was right. I struck the phrases even as they formed, not just because they were objectionable in themselves, but because none of them answered his real fear, which was true, I thought, that we can never be sure of what we want, I mean of the authenticity of it, of its purity in relation to ourselves. Everything in us has been put there by others, I thought. 
Our very selves are, artif are artifacts, unoriginal, a consequence of actions malevolent or benign, and not just of actions, but accidents, casual and without intention, free of any design. And even as I thought this, it seemed both true to me and false. Just past the grocery, there was a wide trench where they were extending the metro across Mlados, tearing open whole segments of pavement and earth a few hundred meters at a time, and along the length of it was a simple chain fence draped in green plastic mesh, the metal poles anchored in plastic buckets filled with concrete. It was meant as a deterrent, but really it would have been easy to get through. The blocks weren't heavy. With a little effort, you could shift them. Work had been stopped for days. It was too dangerous in the wind, and when we came to the fence, we saw that one of the poles had tipped over. The wind had caught the green mesh so that now it hung suspended over the drop held in places by its neighbors, which for the moment were still upright. Jesus, I heard our say, or thought I heard it, and we kept our distance as we walked to a segment of unbroken ground where we could cross. And then we were on my street and at my building, and the door slammed shut behind us. R started up the stairs, not waiting for the elevator as we usually did. I only lived on the third floor, but we had made a kind of ritual of it. As soon as the doors closed, we kissed and groped each other, half silly and half sincere, pulling apart at the last moment before the doors opened again. But today, R took the stairs, and I followed him, letting him climb ahead of me. He hadn't pressed the switch to set the lights running on their timer, and so neither did I. The hallways were dark, but there was a dull light from the window at each floor, neon signs and lights from neighboring buildings filtered through the unwashed glass. I could hear noises from the apartments we passed, televisions and voices that mixed with the sound of the wind. And from one, there was a quick burst of laughter, a man's voice, joining in the laughter from the show he was watching. And again, I wished myself in that place of laughter and not here in whatever place this was. R reached my floor and waited for me at the end of the hallway where it was truly dark. There wasn't any window to let in light from the street. He slid past me when I opened the door and headed to the bedroom while I locked it again, resting my hand for a moment on the knob. I didn't feel any of my usual eagerness, the eagerness he usually matched though it wasn't eagerness I had sensed from him on our silent walk or in the haste he had shown just now. I wasn't sure what it was, as I wasn't sure what I should feel in response, and I hung back a moment as I heard the familiar sounds of him undressing, fabric pulled off, the heavy buckle of his belt striking the floor, and then the mattress sighing with his weight. I pulled off my own clothes at the door, I left them and walked to the bedroom naked. He was on his back, one of his arms across his face as if to block the light from his eyes, though there wasn't any light or hardly any. The curtains were drawn across the windows, not the heavy drapes, but the gauze that obscured the interior from view. My building was surrounded by others. Someone could always be watching. I lay down next to him. He was beautiful in the dark his form a deeper shadow beside me, his olive skin and the dense compactness of him. He was the most beautiful, I thought, as I had thought before. I didn't touch him. We lay silent for a moment until finally I spoke, whispering, Scuppy, are you all right? Talk to me, say something. And though he didn't say anything, he did make a noise, a small noise of desire or grief, I couldn't tell which, and then he reached over and pulled me to him, my face first, and then as we kissed the rest of me, his hands urged me to move until I was on top of him. It felt like passion, his mouth and his hands on me. It felt like the hunger I was still amazed I could arouse in him. He pressed his pelvis into me, making me feel that he was hard as I was. I responded to him even in the atmosphere left behind by his story, its dull balefulness like the residual light in which I could see him as I lifted myself up. His eyes squeezed shut and on his face an expression I couldn't read. And then I pressed down and his lips parted and he made a sound that was unmistakably of pleasure, I thought. He pulled my face to his again. 
He slid his tongue into my mouth and drew out my own, which he caught with his lips and teeth, biting it almost to the point of pain. All the while, he was making a sound I had never heard from him before, a series of short moans, almost pants, and as we kissed and pressed against each other, he lifted his knees up on either side of me, as if to wrap them around me, as if to embrace me with all four of his limbs, though that's not what he did. Instead, he shifted his hips up in a way that opened him to me or signaled an intention to open. For a moment, I was confused. It was a reversal of our roles. I had never fucked him before. But when I whispered, are you sure, the strange sounds he made intensified in frequency and volume both. I lifted myself off him and reached to the side table to take a condom from the drawer, but as I tore the little package with my teeth, I heard R say, no. And when I said, what? Taken aback, he said it again more clearly, no. And though I hesitated, I set it aside. I don't know if it was really a judgment I made in the moment I took before I went on. It was more like a minor pressure overcome. Since we had met, he had been my only partner. He was the only partner I wanted, but it was a risk I knew neither of us could be sure the other was safe, and maybe the risk was part of my excitement. Of course it was. Though it wasn't my usual role or a role I usually enjoyed, I was eager for it, more than eager. I was surprised by what I felt as I slicked myself with lubricant from the same drawer, hissing a little at the cold of it, and then I applied it to R between the legs he had raised. I would take my time. I would be gentle. Otherwise, it would be difficult for him, I thought. I mean, more difficult. But he didn't want me to take my time. Go on, he said. I'm ready drawing his legs up further to make room for me. But he wasn't ready. When I entered him, he made a sound that wasn't in any way of pleasure. I stopped, but only for a moment, since he said again, go. At least, that's what I thought he said, go. And I pressed further into him, drawn forward by what he had said and by my own pleasure, which was exquisite. I had never fucked anyone bare before. There was a heat and silkenness in it I had never felt. R had covered his face with his arm again. I couldn't read his expression as I began to move, and really I was marveling so much at my own feeling that for a moment I neglected his. Anyway, he was hiding it. That was why he had covered his face, to hide from me what he felt. I lowered my own face to the arm beneath which he hid, to the pit of his arm. I loved the smell of him, and tonight, beside the familiar scent, there was something else. His endurance, maybe, his response to pain, since pain was what his noises meant, or some of his noises. When I pressed into him, there was a grunt of pain, and when I drew out a little sound of need, an invitation <coughs> or demand that I return, so that if it was pain, it was pleasure, too, or anyway, satisfaction. I liked that I could make him feel this. I found myself seeking new angles to make him feel more need and satisfaction and pain. It was like a new intimacy, though maybe there was something cruel in it as well, some cruelty in myself I sensed the shape of, a shape I had sensed before, but never before with R. I would give him what he wanted, I thought, though whether I was giving something or taking it away, I wasn't sure. There was a sudden noise then, a dull crack that startled me, that startled R2. Both of us tensed for a moment, and then the room was filled with wind, with the noise of it and its force. It made the curtains below. I felt it cold along my back. The window beside the bed had come open. There was a way to turn the handle so that it tilted in a few inches at the top. It must have come unlatched. The wind made a kind of accompaniment as I began to move again a rhythm against which I moved. And as I continued fucking R, I thought of the distance from which it had come, though maybe it doesn't make sense to think of it as having any origin at all. Maybe it was pure circulation, picking things up and setting them down again willy-nilly, not just broken things, but also things that seem whole, the sands of Africa or Greece. It was moving the very lands, I thought, however slowly. Nothing was solid, nothing would stay put. And I thought this even as I held on more tightly to R and drove into him more fiercely, drawing from him those noises of pain and of need, noises maybe of pleasure too. I wanted to root into him. Even as the wind said all rootedness was a shame, there was, sorry, 
I wanted to root into him. Even as the wind said all rootedness was a sham, there were only passing arrangements, makeshift shelters, and poor harbors. I love you, I thought suddenly, in that rush that makes so much seem possible. I love you. Anything I am you have use for is yours. Thank you. <laughs>